Tonight, we're live in Gladstone in central Queensland, a critical state for both sides in this election. It's been another week of smears, stumbles and surprises. Anthony Albanese is now in isolation for a week. Welcome to Q&A. I'm David Spears. It's terrific to be back in Queensland for the first time since 2019. We're coming to you live from the Gladstone Entertainment Convention Centre. Great to have so many of you from surrounding areas as well. We've got people here from Rockhampton and Billawheela with us here tonight. Great to be back on the road. And joining me on the panel from the University of Queensland, Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Engagement, Bronwyn Fredericks, Minister for Resources and Water, Keith Pitt, Amanda Carl, who's helping coal-dependent communities transition to a cleaner future. The member for Kennedy, Bob Catter, and the Labor Senator for Queensland, Murray Watt. Great to have you all here. And remember, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag, so please get involved. Our first question tonight comes from Arthur Ferrer. Good evening. My question to the members of the panel. Both Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese have stumbled this week. Um, sometimes we forget that they're just human. Despite of this, do you think Anthony Albanese has the experience to be the next prime minister of this country? And after the debate last night, do you think who is ahead among these two? Arthur, thank you. And there's a bit in that question. We'll get to the stumbles and the experience. But you know, Arthur mentions they're both human. They certainly are. Anthony Albanese, tonight we've learnt, uh, he, he's told us that he does have COVID. He's isolating for a week now, right in the middle of the election campaign. Murray Watt, I need to point out that you spent a, a fair bit of time with him <laughs> earlier this week, but you have tested negative today for, uh, for COVID, so we appreciate that. Um, but how's he going, first up? Uh, thanks, David, and gre uh, greetings to everyone in the audience. Uh, yeah, I obviously just heard this news myself just before uh, I was coming over from my hotel, so it was a little bit of a surprise. Yeah. Uh, and I want to assure everyone that I did spend three days with Anthony up until a day or so ago, but I have done a rapid test and it's all clear, uh, and hopefully it'll stay that way. So um, mm. obviously I wish Anthony well in his recovery. I've seen his statement saying that he's going to be isolating at home and he's feeling fine. How are you feeling? It's a setback for the campaign, isn't it? Oh, look, I think it's another sign that we live in an unpredictable world with COVID and it's a sign that COVID is not over. Mm. I think a lot of us have been sort of thinking for a while that COVID is something that's in the past, but this is another reminder that it's a reality. But we've been planning for this kind of scenario for a long time. It was always something that might happen. It could happen to either side. So what um, happens with, under the plan? I mean, he's stuck uh, at home, mm. but does someone else continue with the travelling around? Mm. Richard Miles, Jim Chalmers, someone else? Mm. Yeah, well, we'll have a bit more to say tomorrow about the details of exactly how we're going to manage that. But as I say, we have been planning for it for, for a while. Mm. Uh, similar things happen so in the US. there's not going to be a tussle between uh, various Labor front benches over who no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Well, this is, this, is, this is one of the benefits of having a strong and united team. Uh, we, have, we have any number of people who are, who are ready to step up, step up and uh, support Albo. Uh, I sent him a message earlier myself wishing him well and saying we're going to do him proud and I'm sure all of my colleagues will do that. Okay, but you've, you've war-gamed all of this. You've, you've got yeah, there's been a lot of planning going to go. exactly this kind of scenario. Um, well, Keith, Pitt, what, what do you reckon about this development? The Prime Minister had COVID uh, you know, a month or so before the campaign began, began, but what does it mean now that one of the leaders, you know, this is a, the two men vying to be Prime Minister, one of them is now knocked out uh, in isolation for a week? Well, well, firstly, I want to congratulate the ABC, which I'm sure that's not something you expected to hear. Always have How to good it. is it to see you actually out of Sydney yeah. in central Queensland in Gladstone? So I don't think it should take an election <laughs> campaign to make that happen. <laughs> Great um, to be but, here. But, but to, your, you. to your point, David, I mean, this is just it's what hap what's happening to everyday Australians every single day. Uh, and we know it's challenging. We know it's been difficult. Uh, and as you know, the, the questioner said earlier, we are human. Uh, this, is, this is what happens. Yeah. I'm triple vaccinated. I've had COVID, two rat tests this week. 
Uh, but in terms of the question, I'm sorry, I actually missed the debate. I was on an aeroplane. Uh, okay. It's a very long way from Perth to Darwin. Well, we'll, we'll get, <coughs> get into some of the, Arthur's question goes to some of the stumbles. Um, let me ask, well, oh. perhaps, perhaps you, Bronwyn, mm -hmm. because last week Anthony Albanese didn't know the unemployment rate. Last night at the, uh, at the debate, the Sky News debate, it was the Prime Minister who used this phrase about a kid with um, autism and talked about being blessed that his mm -hmm. own girls uh, didn't have that challenge. He's apologised for any offence caused today. What do you think about these sorts of... Um, uh, gaff stumbles, whatever you want to call them. How much do they matter? Well, we can, people can get distracted by the gaffes. I mean, you know, it's one person and Arthur's right. You know, people make mistakes. We're all human. Those mistakes can happen to any of us. One of us could be really nervous tonight and stumble even over our words. I could do it. You could do it. I, the host I certainly could do, could do it. Do I would it. hope those doesn't do it. <laughs> but I want to be really focused on the policy platform. Mm. I want to know what the policies are that is behind the parties in terms of when I go to cast my vote at the election poll, I'm going to be focused on that party or those individuals or that candidates and what they stand for. What do they support mm. and what they don't support? Mm. What, what, what are they going to? And, and just in terms of COVID, you're right, Keith, COVID is not over. Um, we, we see people in the audience here wearing the masks. Yep. Um, I know very much that people have that front and centre. Even a week and a half ago, I was in Cairns and Yarrabah um, to affirm the Uluru Statement from the Heart in terms of constitutional enshrinement of a voice to Parliament. Before we got on buses to go to Yarrabah from Cairns, we undertook rat tests. So communities are taking steps themselves in regards to it's COVID. It's becoming a, a way of life, uh, That's isn't correct. it? Um, let, let me, Amanda, come back to this, this question around um, stumbles that Arthur mentions, how much they matter, and, and specifically he was asking whether Anthony Albanese has the experience for the top job. What do you think? Yeah, I was... My first reaction was, you know, it's tough. It must be really tough on the campaign trail. They're in multiple places all the time. And they've got to have their heads across so many different things. But it was interesting. I had an insight this week preparing for this. This is my first big show like this. And, you know, I've got friends with a lot more media experience and everyone wanted to give me advice around how to frame the message for You're everybody. in politics, mate, I can tell you now. <laughs> <laughs> I was always on advice. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, you know, don't say this. Make sure you get this in. Use this stat. Don't say that. And I thought, wow, politicians must be getting that 100 times worse. Mm. But you know what happened? And so and it's, like, it's almost like a performance. You have to remember your lines. And so you're going to mess that up every so often. But the problem is, I think, and I'm feeling this whenever I do a lot of work in communities, there's such scepticism now when they're hearing those lines because it's so much focus on the message instead of the substance. The and I think sometimes it gets lost when we're trying, in the world of social media, have the perfect message for everybody. Bob Catter, you've been around politics for a while. You've seen leaders stumble and, and make gaffes and so on. Do they matter in the end? Um, I think that uh, Anthony getting COVID, he probably wished he had it a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Scott Morris has been opening a few times, wished he'd had it as well. Um, um, look, I, I think, you know, there's two things that leap to my mind with the uh, leadership. And uh, I said to Anthony Albanese once, I said, why are you different? I didn't have to explain to him mm. what I meant by that. He said, because I worked for three years labouring before I went to university. Mm. That was exactly, you know, what gives him that magical common touch. Having said that, Scott Morrison, very courageously on Good Friday last year, made a stand for Christianity. And as a Christian, I, I feel we're a persecuted minority group. And whether that's right or not, that's the way I feel. And I thought it was very courageous of him to stand up uh, as he did on Good Friday last what, what year. What did you think of his comment last night about kids with a disability? Did, did it strike you as any, <sighs> anything offensive? Oh, look, you know... <laughs> There's a thousand times any politician would make a remark that was uh, wrong, and I'm not going to go over some of them that I have friends of mine that have said something that was misinterpreted, and, uh, and just the persecution that took place so unfairly, and that's, that's my reflection upon the comments. What did you think, Murray? What? Uh, in terms of the debate generally... No, but just, uh, just on this, on the, on on the, this point the, of what I mean, the PM look, said. I think it was a bit of an insensitive remark, and certainly uh, friends of mine who have children with autism took it that way. Um, you know, as Anthony said in his press conference today, 
uh, he thinks, and I think most of us think, that every child is blessed and every parent is blessed. And Well, the, the PM, um, in fairness, did say that again today. That that's, he yeah, agrees with that. He, he apologised for it. He cleaned him. it up today. I, I accept okay. that. But I think it was a bit of an unfortunate sort of remark, and I think it made a lot of people feel pretty uncomfortable. Um, in terms of the stumbles and gaps and things like that, I think that was one of the things I found most interesting about the debate last night was that not one question from the audience was about that. Mm -hmm. um, all of the questions from the audience were actually about their daily challenges, whether it be housing affordability or um, you know, uh, aged care or their job or their health care and things like that. And it made me wonder whether all of us in politics, the media included, might be a little bit too obsessed with you know, the gotcha moments mm -hmm. and things like that, when I reckon if you spoke to most people in the crowd here tonight, that's not what they're well, thinking it, about either. Well, it did show people want substance, and yep. we're going to get to some more substance uh, mm -hmm. here tonight. So our next question comes from Jeff Ford. Thank you, David. I'd like the panel's opinion on a hot topic at the moment. Do we have much to fear now that China and the Solomon Isles have signed a security pact? Keith Pip. Look, it's a really good question. It's something that's being raised, and I think it is an issue of concern. And the government is certainly concerned about the situation. Oh. No, we, we, we are, Bob. Uh, look, the, the other challenge, of course, is these are sovereign nations. Uh, they make their own decisions. Yes, we provide significant support uh, to the Solomons. Uh, yes, we're out there working with the Pacific family uh, to try and ensure you know, their security, and we provide a lot of overseas development aid. I think it's about 160 million into the Solomons from memory every single year. We're the biggest single provider. Uh, now, the decision that they've made is incredibly disappointing. It's not one that we agree with. Uh, we are concerned about the situation and what it means in the long term for the security of the nation and the instability that it might create. Now, we are obviously monitoring it very closely. Uh, the PM, the Foreign Minister and others have all been in contact uh, with uh, Sogavare, Sogavare's government. But, I mean, every person in this room, oh, I don't need to point out the facts, right? This is clearly a very challenging situation. Well, you probably, one, it's we, one we didn't want to be in. Let's point out the facts, though. Is, is, is it your belief this will lead to uh, a Chinese military base in the Solomons? Your leader, Barnaby Joyce, reckons this will be like our own little Cuba off our coast. PM Sogavare has made some comments uh, that that won't happen. I'd like to take him at his word. Do you? Well, we, we've provided significant support through Ramsey, for example, uh, security forces when it was required. We've got AFP over there right now. I appreciate now. all that. Do you take him at his word? How else do you deal with people, David? You, you have to trust and believe what they say. You don't you know, think there'll be a little Cuba off our coast? From a security viewpoint, I'm concerned about it, absolutely. And the people who talk to me, everyday Australians, are concerned about it, mm. as, as they should be. Will there be a military base there, though, is what I'm asking? Look, I can't forecast what China may or may not do, but you know, you've raised Barnaby. I'll come back to one of his common points. We, we need to make our nation as strong as possible as quickly as we can, oh, and we have to be able yes. to pay for it. And that's but, what we're doing. Uh, Bob Catter, I you're in here. Oh, look, I mean... <laughs> I want to say something. I, I mean, in four and a half years, Keith, you haven't built a rifle, you haven't built a machine gun, you have stupidly built patrol boats that have got one machine gun on them. Oh, geez, that'll terrify the Chinese having that machine gun on those patrol boats. <laughs> That's actually not a fact. $60 million for a patrol boat that has a machine gun on it. It should have had 40 missiles on it. If you, it's a hell of a patrol if boat. You, if you are serious about China, and look, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that I'm wrong. But why would China want the port of Darwin? What, do we have some great trade going through Darwin, do we? We have a few moo cows that I've seen through Darwin, <laughs> that's about it. Why do they want Darwin? Why would they want, and no one knows this, so I'm going to tell you tonight, Meriden is an air base. It can take Constellation planes that three or four planes can bring in a couple of battalions of Red Guard Marines. Meriden is 90 kilometres this side of Perth. Right across, it's the terminus, the East West Railway Line, terminus East West Highway, right? Why would you want an air base at Meriden? What, are we going to have so, tourists leaving Perth to go to China from Meriden Air Base? Okay, well, let's can, stick with the Solomon's question. There, there is though, danger heard. here, mm. very serious danger. So what do you think about the Solomons, though, just quickly, uh, Bob? I mean, clearly the Solomon Islands is going to be a base for China. I mean, if you don't believe that, you are very, very naive. And if you can't see... Now, if you want to defend this country... And I've said it over and over again, I've got a lot of criticism, and I'll probably get a lot more. If you want to defend this country, 
you build a missile fortress wall around it. So do you think this is a failure of the, the government? A can complete I, failure. There hasn't been a missile built in four and a half can, years. Amanda, what, what about... No, 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 please let me finish just one just quickly, second yep. more, David, if I could, please. Yep. You build a missile fortress wall, and if you make it through that missile fortress wall, then waiting for you is five million rifles. And if you say, is that going to defend the nation? Well, go and ask the Ukrainians. They're taking on the second biggest army in the world, and they've held them at bay for four months. Okay. Amanda, let me ask yeah. you, you did, you did spend some years living in uh, Fiji. Yeah. What was your experience of what China was doing in the Pacific at the yeah. time? Yeah, um, there was interesting, it was t there was talk of this happening back in 2014 um, across a number of different Pacific island nations. I worked in international development at the time. And it was really interesting, just between 2014, I think maybe 2016, so within two and a half years, the built environment changed in Fiji because China was actually coming in, building hospitals, roads, schools, um, and it was really marked on the landscape. In return, they were getting rights to minerals and fishing rights and also land to build quite large industrial piggeries and things like that. And so this has been coming a long time, as you But what was really interesting about it was the rhetoric, and I think what happens next depends on Australia's response to this, because the rhetoric from the Fijian government and others was, you know, Australia's been the only aid um, player on the block, mm. and we had been throwing our weight around, around our, our terms around that aid and what we expected in return. China comes in, and all of a sudden, there's someone else to play with. And so there was, there was a bit of pushback against Australia, and even words like colonial kind of stuff being put around. And the problem was, that's exactly when we started cutting our aid. We were supposed to increase aid around then, and instead, in the last 10 years, we've decreased our aid by 30%, whereas the rest of the OECD countries has increased their aid by 26%. So at the time we should have been building that relationship, we actually took that away and made the situation worse. So I'm not surprised that this situation is happening at all. David, can I just add something? Okay. I mean... I know Keith has got to try and sugarcoat this, but this is a total cluster. This mm. is a total foreign policy cluster from a government that prides itself on its national security credentials. I mean, this government is essentially going to this election arguing that they can be trusted on two things, the economy and national security. <laughs> We've had the facts. worst national security and foreign policy breach of an Australian government since the Second World War. We've got an economy with the most debt the most deficits, the highest, the second highest taxing government in Australian history with we'll, wages we'll get to the lower than Let's they've just ever stick been. With this, though. What would you have done to prevent what you're calling the worst well, we failure turned up. in the Pacific since World we War We would have turned up. What does that mean? Um, so uh, this is a... We would have actually sent our foreign minister, if not our prime minister, and much, much you think much that, would have stopped, that would have stopped this? I think it would have been worth a try. But I would mean, it have stopped Keith, Keith and other Solomon government, signing this agreement? Keith and other government ministers have been saying, oh, look, sovereign nations, you know, you can't bully people. No one's talking about going and bullying people. People are talking about getting on a plane and going and having a chat, and we didn't even do that. We cut aid, as, as Amanda said. Um, well, just, Pacific... just on that, I, I should point out that the, the government would argue that in terms of the Pacific, aid did increase. It depends how you look at it. It does. It's very, it clear, does. very yeah. clear that a number of aid programs to the Solomon Islands were cut by this government, along with okay. to the Pacific generally. And more broadly, this debacle is just another example, a, a textbook example of Scott Morrison. Goes missing... Um, by not taking action early enough, blames other people, makes excuses. It's exactly the bushfires, the vaccines, the floods all over again. He does it every single time, never takes responsibility, and Australians pay the price. Uh, okay, well, let's just back really on this didn't one. Take long, just, David, on the did point, it? just on the point <laughs> that the government should have sent at least the foreign minister before this deal was signed, not the, the more junior minister for the Pacific, Zed Seselja. What do you say to that? Well, well, let's look at the actual reality. I mean, Ch China is looking to increase its influence. Uh, and it happened in Australia. You had a Victorian Labor government that signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay. The you question, can't blame the Victorian question, but government but for this. But it's I mean, true. They're, they're the blaming so, people again. My, there my you question go. was, <laughs> so, you've heard this criticism. Can you understand why the foreign minister wasn't sent? Uh, well, look, I haven't had a direct conversation with Maurice. Now, can you, I, but can I know, you as a, I know as a that cabinet they have minister been, in this government understand why the foreign minister wasn't sent? But, well, what I can tell you is they've been in contact with the government. They've had direct contact from the prime minister and the foreign minister. Uh, and Zed was dispatched because he is the minister for the Pacific. The foreign minister we know that. He, a fundraiser. He, he, that's his can job. You, do you think that was the right call? Well, it was the one that was available that we managed immediately. Now, I don't know what is in Maurice's diary. I don't a know fundraiser. what in other, other cabinet that's ministers' That's what's come out. Diaries. Now, it, David, your remark was spot on. You know, we can't compete in a buying war with China. It's, you know, the biggest economy on earth. We're a little tiny country. We can't compete. And we don't compete. But you stand to defend your island 
I mean, Churchill said we will defend our island. He was outnumbered like 50 to 1. Guess who won in the end? Look at Ukraine. That's an inspiration for all of us, and it should be. All right, we need to move on. And before we dive into the energy transition that's facing Australia, and in particular this part of Queensland, here's Casey Briggs with a snapshot of the area. The seat of Flynn, named after the Reverend John Flynn, founder of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And that's a fitting name for a seat that relies on that service. This is the eighth biggest electorate in the country. Taking in Emerald and surrounding towns in the west, all the way to Gladstone on the coast, stretching north to the outskirts of Rockhampton and south to Bundaberg. And this is one of the electorates that's most directly connected to coal. 7.2% of people over 15 in Flynn work in the coal mining industry. This one seat is home to more than a tenth of all Australians who work in coal mining. No surprises then that the candidates for both major parties want to be seen supporting the industry. Labor backs the uh, coal industry, Labor backs the LNG industry, and no one backs it more than I do right here in central Queensland. This is the real stuff. This is what is paying for us, our education, our health and emergency services. It is underpinning the, the economy of Australia. The next biggest industry in the seat is beef cattle farming, employing more than 5% of people in the electorate. Last election, Labor's vote was strong in Gladstone and the Aboriginal community of Woorabinda, plus a handful of other booths. But the LNP won most of the vote outside the seat's biggest city. The LNP holds it on an 8.7% margin, and it's one of Labor's targets in regional Queensland. The other party to watch is One Nation. In 2019, it got its second highest primary vote in the nation in Flynn. So this is clearly a part of Australia that is heavily reliant on the resources sector. Let's get to our first question on this, and it comes from Carol Holden. Good evening. The major parties seem to me to be pussyfooting around the idea of transition to a clean energy economy, with candidates from both sides of politics talking up their support for coal and coal mines. It looks to me, to me as though this is because no one has the faintest idea of how to go about a fair and viable transition. Now, Germany, for example, is now using 50% renewables with a goal of 100% by 2035. Transition can be done with intelligent planning and goodwill and cooperation of the major stakeholders, such as the unions, big business, government and the communities. Why can't we do something like this at a federal level in Australia? Carol, thank you for the question. Amanda, I want to come to you first. This is what, this is what you do. Yep. What does a just and viable transition, in Carol's words, look like in a place like Gladstone? Yeah, well, the first thing is we might not be seeing that leadership at a federal level, but the good news is local governments all over Australia and coal regions are taking the reins on this because they're seeing change now. Like, it is here. It's, an, it's not something down the track that's inevitable. We're seeing, you know, mines that have been approved but not funded. We're seeing early closures of power plants. So this is really affecting communities. So we go where we're invited, and we're invited by coal communities at the moment in the Hunter and Latrobe Valley in central Queensland. To, because people are saying, what do we do about this? How do we manage it? And we know what to do to manage it. We actually have the answers. You need to use the time you've got to diversify your regional base, your economy. You need to look after workers. And there's some really good examples um, where if you can start thinking about this in the long term, you've got time to train, to develop skills for the new industries, to redeploy workers, which they've done in La Trobe Valley. Um, so, you know, we know what we need to do to support workers. But the biggest question is, how do you diversify those regional economies? Gladstone's a really great example because they're getting in early and there's, there's so many opportunities here that people are starting to explore. So it's not just the renewable energy that's being built, it's what we could do with that renewable energy. So it's things like green hydrogen, it's manufacturing renewable energy parts, it's um, looking at land use differently. And this is what's happening all over Australia. This is actually happening, industries investing in it. Um, the problem is we've just had a federal government sort of missing in action and actually helping regions to get on with it. Bronwyn, I want to hear from you on this as well. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? What needs to happen when we talk about transition? 
Well, we've got to look at uh, training and education, just like Amanda said, in regards to what communities get from that. So if you move things out what, and putting something else in, what happens in that process of training, education, vet training. I know here locally there's a university, a regional university, and a shout out to CQ <coughs> University tonight, who has vet programs, who um, is focused on training tradespeople and focused on you know, upskilling and training. The issue then for them is also about getting training teachers or teachers to teach tradespeople. We know that in the trades industry, the average ages are in the 50s. So that's becoming an increasing problem for us. I think it's also um, people, people would be remiss if they didn't understand that people in mining, and my own partner works in mining. I think he's here um, tonight. He's here this okay. evening, um, and family members are engaged in mining. It would be wrong for people to assume that people in the industry aren't also looking at what solutions are. They right. certainly are. There are they're, mining they're the ones families. asking us to come. Yeah, they yeah. are right. That's yeah. right, Amanda. There's communities seeking answers and know that it can't happen forever. And they see the um, impacts of mining, but also know that there has to be a process to move from what's happening now mm. to the renewables. And there has to be an investment then to do the things that Amanda explained, there needs to be investment in that infrastructure, in research, in training, mm. in order for that to happen. Bob? I'm also, just hang on a minute, yep. I'm also with the University of Queensland that there is the Sustainable Mining Institute that is very engaged with communities, traditional owner groups, mm. um, around what's happening in mining and land reforesting and revegetation from mine closures to managing land bases in the best way possible. But that also needs to happen. If communities want to move to the next phase, then it needs to be a whole phased approach and planned and developed approach. And in that, Indigenous peoples need to be engaged in that process from get-go, from the beginning to end and sitting at the table. Mining companies and resource companies, and this also goes with government, you can't keep doing acknowledgements to country and welcomes to country and having Aboriginal art on the boardrooms, mm. on the walls, wearing Aboriginal art in logos and in uniforms, and then not engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the very rooms that are making decisions, whether it's about shutdown, <laughs> whether, it, whether it's about shutdowns or whether it's about planning and whether it's about the new developments new industries. Bromma, thank you. And I, just coming back to Carol's question about transition, um, and I suspect amongst the three politicians here, we might get some different views to what we've just heard. Uh, Bob Caddy, shaking your head at words like <coughs> diversifying and, and, and transition. Why? David, you know, and everyone here listen to me, please. This country exports $350 billion a year of product. Almost all of that it's just from two products, coal and iron ore. They account for 250 billion of that 350 billion. Now you take out coal, you bankrupt this country. You bankrupt this country. This was a little service station. Gladstone was a little service station on the highway. It is now uh, 60,000 people, one of the richest cities in Australia, and one of the richest cities on earth. And I was a party of the government that created this city. Um, we created the city. But Bob, can, can, you, can you hold back all the pillars, here? Please listen, let me finish, David. I'm, I'm finishing, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to pull those pillars <laughs> down, then my brothers and the CFMEU will stand up and we'll fight you. You're taking our jobs away and sending them to China. Congratulations uh, can I, can to you. I just, just Congratulations to you. Okay. A wonderful victory for you. Bob. You've created jobs, yes, in China. Bob, I just need to ask, though, can, can government actually yeah. stop this change coming? Can the tide be held back if this is where the world is moving? David, I don't know why people don't research issues. I mean... One of the greatest breakthroughs in Australia recently. Mm. You, yeah, well, you're laughing. I'll bet you you have not read the report by the university that did the studies on algae. You can take all of the CO2 from a coal-fired power station, 
and have it absorbed by algae in ponds. And on the figures, so, and they won the United Nations Prize for the Environment. Well, I haven't read the that research. people that did the study. But it's clear where investors are going. For the environment. You can take all of the emissions from a coal-fired power station, grow algae, and make more money off the algae than you will off the electricity. The, the with problem, zero emissions. Well, we've got a, zero okay. emissions. We've got there a few challenge. questions along these United lines Nations that I want to get through. Prize yeah. for environment. Okay, okay. For Australia. Hold, hold your the resources minister minute. might want to add yeah. something okay. as well, David. We do, we do have a few questions along these lines that I want to get to. Uh, Matthew Graving's got the next one. Matthew. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm a diesel fitter who's worked in mining for the past 14 years. Replacing our ageing power stations with coal coal gasification place, uh, plants would provide efficient green-based load power for domestic and industrial use and job security for thousands of miners such as myself. Mm. Otherwise, what is your plan to retrain me so I can be a productive member of society when I'm made redundant? Right. Keith Pip. We'll give you immigration uh, papers to go to China. You get jobs there. Okay. I'll, I'll be very clear. Mate, I want you to stay in your job. That's what I want. I want you to continue oh, you to don't. contribute to the country. You signed up to uh, And we want to come back to a couple of facts here. I mean, there were some comments about Germany. I can tell you Germany right now is looking for gas. They're looking to re-stand right. up their nuclear reactors. Dead right. Because Dead right, the most please. important Dead thing right. we can do in this country is Dead ensure right. our national energy security. It is directly tied to the national security of Australia. So now, we only have to look at the uncertainty, David, Just on this, David, these in questions around transition, are, yeah, you, yeah. are you saying we don't need to think about transition? No, we should resist and transition? Is that... and, and I'm coming to that right now. Okay. So this year, this financial year, coal will become the second commodity in this country ever to go through $110 billion of uh, economic activity into this country. It employs a heap of people. And I'm not sure where you're staying, David, but if you had a look out the window, you might see what it does for the people of Gladstone, sure. because it's not just coal miners. It is diesel fitters. It is people that work in bakeries. It is the entire yeah. economy yeah. here. And but we the concern support for some it. is, what's this going to look like in 10 years, 20 years? So uh, do you think transition is something that should be resisted or embraced? Uh, well, what, what I'll guarantee is that we are standing with our traditional industries. I want to see them get bigger, not smaller. If they're yeah, buying, yeah. we're selling. So how, it's yeah. how are you going to do that if you don't have an international market that wants to buy a product well, it's, anymore? It's, it's not supported by... David, can I... No, can I... Uh, we're just going to hear from yeah, the yeah. minister. No, can hold, can, hold can on, I buddy. actually I'll speak about you. this? Because there's also an opportunity cost here. The world is actually crying out increasingly for the minerals that we need for renewable energy. So to go to your question about replacing ageing coal fire plants with others, the problem is with the early closure notices we're getting at the moment, and I do work with energy companies and boards of energy companies, is because they can't compete on costs anymore with renewable energy plus storage. Coal is, electricity is more expensive now. So... It's actually, I'm actually worried that we're going to get to a situation where the private energy companies are going to close them down before we have enough renewable energy. Okay, well, I think, to, I think to, there's to a fundamental them. question we but need they're, to address they're... here beyond what the world and the international investors are doing. Yep. Your government, do you actually support net zero by 2050? Well, that's the commitment we've made. <laughs> and we'll do, do it you, through technology, do you, David. Do you? Well, well, clearly, I'm, I'm a member of the government. Okay. So let's come back to the fundamentals. He got back Pro into cabinet price... as a result of that, well, that's you might remember. Not, that's not true. <laughs> But you've got your talking points up, well, you're done. True. So the fundamentals are clear. <laughs> Demand is up, price is up, uh, things like carbon capture and storage and all the technology... You're going to get to net zero. But, but, but There's going to be this, transition. But, these, but this is the way to deliver it. Now, the argument <laughs> always becomes about the fuel source, but the argument should be about your emissions level. Now, if we can manage that with technology, then we should utilise the resources of Australia. Which will That's push what they're power here prices for. up. Oay. But I Murray mean, White, let me come to you on this, because there are a lot of concerns that have come through about transition, what it looks like, a lot of talk about a hydrogen hub and so on. What is Labor actually saying you will do if given the chance to help this transition? Well, David, and to the audience, our policy can be really summed up very simply. What we're about is more jobs in more industries. Mm. And I think this is one of the big problems with this debate that we've seen for so long, is that the sort of extremes on the left and right have been running this agenda that you can either have the traditional industries or the new ones. But what Labor's saying is that we do support our traditional industries. We do support the mining industry. In towns like Gladstone, we support smelting and refining and agriculture and things like that as well. We want to take them up the value chain, so some more value adding, so that we get more value here, rather than letting that value be derived overseas. 
and we want to get the new industries. And that's where this government, as Amanda says, has been completely missing in action. So what would you do to get uh, this hydrogen hub? Mm. You know, it needs a lot mm. more, uh, particularly mm. if it's green hydrogen, a lot more renewable energy. Mm. Uh, where, where would that come from? Where would the water come from? Well, for starters, I'll, I'll come to hydrogen in a tick, but this is the, the incredible benefit for towns like Gladstone and central Queensland in general, if that we can have a government that is serious about re investing in renewable energy and bringing it online. Because every company that operates in this town at the moment, Rio Tinto, Origin, Santos, Shell, they're all making commitments about net zero by 2050. Yeah. They have moved on. That's right. They are looking yeah. about how they can change their power sources to take up these options. And what that means is that if we can have them in places like Gladstone, that means more jobs into the future, more smelting, more hydrogen. Um, so that's actually going to set this town and this region up for decades to come. It's not about cancelling the things that we're doing now. Um, there will be people overseas who will want, want to continue buying Queensland coal to make steel for a long time to come. What we should be doing at the same time is building those new industries rather than what Keith did as the Minister for Northern Australia, which was veto a loan from the federal government for a wind farm in North Queensland. Mate, I need to, oh, that, come on, I need to answer that. You did. 200 you, jobs okay, just outside Canberra are gone. Just a quick answer on that, been, on that Minister. 200 jobs gone. Good, good, good on you, Keith. Good good is on. That <laughs> it included battery backup, which it did not. Good on you, Keith. That it, it the company's website said it had battery power. Just let him answer your question. Barry, let's just let him answer your question. Mate, I read the proposal. I'm an electrical engineer. The website of the company says they have batteries. Let's oh, come back to this region. Back batteries. to this so region. What, what would you do to help the hydrogen potential here? What, as, as a government, if you're re-elected, yep. would you do to make it happen? David, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing right now. Uh, I'm looking to embed this country in the supply chain for critical minerals and other areas of demand. It's what we announced in our resources plan on Monday. We've got significant funding on board. We need to make sure that we are in the supply chain with like-minded democracies. It, it is in our national interest to do that. And we can do both, right? We can continue to support our traditional industry. We, we can take up new opportunities. Once I'll come back to what I said earlier. If they're buying, we're selling. I don't care if it's hydrogen, critical okay. minerals, lithium. Th there is we an need opportunity. to support them all. There is an opportunity, David, also, in this test. region. Just, just very quickly. That in this region, like I'm hearing from industry, that there are actually not enough. Um, there's not enough labour to service the existing mining industry. That's right. So if you're going to invest in lithium, copper, cobalt, vanadium, all the things that we need, and nickel, and things that we actually have. Where is that workforce going to come from? There's going to be some opportunity costs. Where are you going to put public funding into if infrastructure? Are you going to develop the new or are you going to keep doubling down the old? Because there is a limit to well, that. Well, we can do both. Okay. It is in the resources plan. OK, just Bob, cut it quickly. let's just reach reality land. We're a tiny little country of predominantly Europeans hmm. sitting in the middle of Asia, 25 million people. India is a country of nearly 1,000 million people. And they are building coal-fired power stations. I will give you the Scientific American Journal, written by an environmentalist. The problem is no one's building them here. Coal. Well, they're, they're, please they're let me for finish, David. Please let me finish. Okay. Just quickly. Right? The Adani is here because he wants to build the coal-fired power stations in India, and he wants to be richer than a Mambi and be the richest man in the world, which he will be because they're building four or 500 coal-fired power stations. The cost, and I'm an expert, because unlike all these other people, I got the science prize for Australia because I put <laughs> okay. the first standalone solar system in in Australian history. All right, Bronwyn, you just right? wanted to add something but quickly. But please let me to, finish. Just very quickly, we've got a lot Adani of questions we want to get to tonight. buying Adana. that coal. Okay. And the Indians will be buying that we've coal. We've heard that point. Bronwyn, don't you defy them. Bromley did just you like very you angry to add indeed. Yeah. Look. But I'm looking after your job, mate, and I'll fight for it. Don't Bromley. worry about it. Thank I, you, Bob. I live yeah. in the real world too, and I also <laughs> know having worked in worked for decades in and out of central Queensland and as a FIFO worker <clears> to to Rockhampton region, is that this community of Gladstone and this region has got decades of innovation in it. Yeah. They have always stepped up to delivery, whether it's yeah. around disaster, okay. whether it's around industry, whether it's around community activity, whether it's around Port Curtis Coral Coast Aboriginal Corporation activities, all of those things, health service delivery, null and do health service, all of those 
across the whole community, and I could name, you know, Anglicare, CWA, all of those groups have always stepped up for innovation. Okay. They will take some of this forward themselves, with or without government. Right. I'm adamant of that. We do need to move on. We do need to move on because a lot more questions we want to get to tonight. Our next one comes from Gaston Boulanger. Uh, good day. So um, I'm a GP here in the town, and um, the problem is, is that not enough young doctors want to become GPs anymore. And even less doctors want to go to the regions or to go uh, rural or remote. And there's also another problem, an enormous gap between the income of specialists and GPs. Mm -hmm. So my question uh, to, the, to the panel is, how can we um, make the gap between the, the salaries of GPs and specialists smaller? And how can we get doctors from the cities into the rural areas and regional areas? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, look, it's It's a good question, Gaston. We've had a, a number of questions about the regional GP shortage. Can I just ask you, as a local or regional GP here, what do you think the answer is yourself to this problem you identify? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very, do we have an hour or so? <laughs> we don't. We can have a chat. But you, you mentioned specialists are paid too much, in your view, GPs not enough. Yeah, it is a complex problem. So uh, if, if specialists make two or three times more money than GPs, then when young kids become a doctor, they want to become a specialist. Mm. Uh, there are too many doctors in the, in the cities, and here we're crying out for doctors to come and work here. Mm. Um, so we really need to get some tricks to get those doctors here. And you can do that by two things, by using carrots and try to lure them in you know, yeah. with money, and, but you can also use sticks and kick them out of the cities into the, into the right. rural area. There you go. So there you we go. want to talk about carrots and sticks. Thank you very much. Uh, Murray, what does Labor have any carrots and sticks in this uh, election campaign? Well, we've certainly got carrots. I'm not sure I'm going to re reveal some sticks in the middle of an election campaign. Um, <laughs> what are the but, carrots? Um, it's it's uh, good to see you, Gaston. I've actually, I've actually heard the hour-long version from Gaston out of his clinic, okay. so it's good to, good to see you again. Uh, and this is a really... I mean, you could hear from the applause in the audience. Yeah. This is a massive issue in central Queensland. Only a couple of weeks ago, I was door-knocking with our candidate, Matt Burnett, in Gracemere, just outside Rocky, mm -hmm. went down two or three streets where every single person said they have to wait three weeks to get a GP appointment. So and what's the answer? It's the same across the region. Um, I think there have been a, a couple of really big problems under this government um, that, that need to be looked at. There was obviously the, the freeze on the Medicare rebate. We get for to the so answer on years. this, sorry. I, I'm yeah, just so conscious of the time. Freeze on the Medicare We're just looking rebate. For, Gaston's asking for some yep. answers. We, well, what, and partly as a result of conversations I had with Gaston, we made so, some recent announcements about rezoning essentially areas like Gladstone to allow for overseas trained doctors to come back in. Um, uh, rural communities and regional communities have heavily relied on overseas trained doctors mm -hmm. for a long time and they provide a fantastic service. Uh, but for many years, as people here will know, Gladstone and this region was left off the list and couldn't attract those overseas trained doctors. So we have said that should be restored. Um, and I know that CQU is uh, and now, UQ. and UQ, are now operating locally based medical schools, which I think will go a long way um, because at the moment, young people who want to study medicine from this region have to go to Brisbane or Townsville to study, and many of them don't come back. Mm -hmm. So I think more of that sort of um, make Making more of those university places in regions, I think, is a really good okay. way forward. Bob Catter, how much of a problem is this in your neck of the woods? I love this doctor for saying this. I took two weeks, did nothing else except talk to doctors. You need to pay an extra $85,000 a year to doctors to serve. And, I mean, I, I served in a government. We had no doctor problems because if you want to become a doctor in Queensland, you spent two years in the regions where we sent you, where we sent you. Um, so it's not real. It's not a real difficult problem, really. But the, well, the question is, who pays the extra eighty-five grand a year? The taxpayer, the patient. The, the taxpayers, of course. I mean, you know, it's not a lot of money. We're talking about maybe a couple of hundred doctors here. But you know, if it costs that much, people are in pain, waiting for doctors. They're in pain. I've got doctors. Two of the bugs that went to Canberra, um, Cat and Money Penny. They're in their seventies. I mean, they're still working because they don't want to let their community down. Well, and I'm sure the doctor up here would know what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, Gaston you know, really um, identifies so we, the... You, the answers are there yeah. right now. Okay. Well, and that's, there's just yes, a little bit of carrot, but it's mostly stick. Okay. <laughs>
Gaston <laughs> talks about uh, specialists being paid too much. It can be difficult finding specialists uh, around here as well. Donna Rankin, uh, in fact, is in the audience. Uh, where are you, Donna? There. Um, t tell us a little bit about your experience, the issues you've had in finding a paediatrician. All right. So it uh, took over two years, pre-COVID, for my daughter to receive an autism diagnosis. There is not a single paediatrician in the local area who was qualified to assess children for those common disorders. We had to travel as far as Bundaberg, Rockhampton, Brisbane. I had to quit my job. Mm. Um, I know so many families who have packed up their entire families and left town because there just isn't the service available here. You know, you guys are throwing around numbers, all this money, hundreds of billions of dollars that our region generates That's right. for the yeah, national yeah. economy. Here, yeah, yeah. here. Look, Donna, thank you very much for, um, for, for raising that. It's a, it's a really good example of, uh, you know, someone having to, as you said, quit your job and spend two years trying to get that diagnosis. Keith Pitt, what needs to happen to address both the GP shortage issue and the shortage of paedi paediatricians? Unfortunately, this is a challenge that's been around a long time. Uh, to Gascoigne, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. That's the first point I want to make. And I was assuming you were talking about what was known as District of Workforce Shortage. It's now DPA. I think it's got a different name, exceptional circumstances. I don't know the situation in Flynn. I know my own patch where we had to get exceptional circumstances to try and make sure we keep those GPs. In terms of the specialists, right, it's a really complex issue. So, uh, Regional Health Minister... But do you have any Do answers Dr. in this election campaign? I well, mean, we heard a few there Well, from well I'm, com I'm coming to that, David. So, uh, Dr David Gillespie's made some changes for GPs to start with, uh, and one of those is that uh, their, their HEX will be paid if they take service in regional and remote Australia for GPs, uh, for Australian trained graduates. I think that's a good, that's a good move. But one of the fundamental challenges with att attracting specialists, and this is not my, my area of expertise, but in my view it's pretty straightforward. They have to be associated with the local hospital service. They have to be associated with what's happening with the base hospital to make sure that you know, they've got, an, A, enough work, and we know that there's enough work, but B, that other support service that's required. Now, we've increased Queensland, Health, uh, Queensland hospital funding by 133%. It's over $6 billion. And yet regional services in this state have gone backwards. They've gone back to Brisbane. Uh, Queensland Labor shut maternity services in, in regional Australia. It, it is outrageous. So we're giving them so much money, as you've pointed out, and yet the services are contracting into the southeast so it's corner. It's not, not your fault. It's, it's not what I'm saying, David. It's a combination. It a bit like it. No, no, but it's a combination of all of these circumstances. We, we okay. need a strong public health system in the regions. The Commonwealth is providing significant funding for that to happen, record levels. But we need to make sure that that work is done both with the state and the Commonwealth, because I agree with you, we need these okay. specialist services in regional Australia. We need to move on. Our next question comes from Bronwyn Dendal. Hi. Thank you. Um, four years ago, two women from Billa Wheeler sat in a Q&A audience and they asked the panel why our friends from Billa Wheeler were taken and why they can't come home. Since then... <laughs> Since then, four years later, this family have been imprisoned on Christmas Island and were kept there um, until their four-year-old daughter, Thanika, was um, so ill she had to be flown to a hospital in Perth. And now the family is trapped in Perth in community detention. The Morrison government is ignoring the majority of Australians and even some of its own um, MPs, including the Deputy Prime Minister, who have all said they want them to come home to Biloela. We're terrified that Mr Morrison is waiting until after this election to force this family to danger because he tried to do that after the last election. So please tell us, what is it going to take for Mr Morrison to simply let this family come home to Billow where they are welcome, wanted and needed? Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Keith Pitt, Roman references Barnaby Joyce, your leader. We, his position's well known on uh, on this family. What's your position? Oh, look, I, I understand this is really difficult for them. I, I, I sympathise. I really do. I, I feel for them. Should but, they but be brought back to Billawee? Well, they, well, David, I know you'll, you'll understand this. So fundamentally, they've been through every court in the land, and there's currently a case. So they're currently before the courts again as a cabinet minister. 
God, I can't make um, remarks. You, you understand the reason for this, and I know well, you do. Barney, so, Barney, 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 Joyce, Barney come, Joyce has made remarks, but, but come, and he's, he's even more senior well, than you. He's the Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I'll come. Well, this is about my remarks, so I'll come back to Alex Hawke. Well, uh, as, as, as the Immigration Minister, he is the only one that has all of the facts. I, I don't have all of the facts. But the reason that our border protection <laughs> has been so strong is because we've been consistent on the rules. Now, I understand the challenges. I absolutely get it. But that consistency has protected this country. It really has. And we'll continue to support it. OK. Bronwyn, did you want to yep. offer a view on um, that? For me, I've got huge sympathy for community in Biloela who are missing the people they love. Um, also for the family who have been in community detention now but who were on the island for some time. Equally so... Um, I also really feel for those other people that have been in detention for years. Yeah. And I mention... <laughs> I, I want to mention, you know, we know that people just were released from detention in Melbourne after nine years. Nine years. I'm not convinced that while we need processes for managing people that are here that it should take nine years or four years. It should be expediated in a way around decision-making and in investigative work and decision-making so that we don't have this. This is a reflection mm. on all of us. Mm. This is a reflection on Australia in terms of how we manage people that are here. Bob and Catter, it's what's... about the humanness. Mm. Like, if we truly look yeah. at us as humans, people in Australia... Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and how we are treating other people that are human as well. Human Bob, life. Bob Catter, what's your view on this, uh, this nut as a lingam? David, I, I come from Glon Curry and I'm dark. I'm one of the Curry mob, you know. And we made a hell of a bad mistake 250 years ago letting you white fellas in, you know. And I don't know if we should make the same mistake again. Having said that, you know, we don't go to church on Sunday. We may not believe in God, but we are Christian philosophically. We're a country philosophically Christian. And it says, love your neighbour and look after them. And there is a humanitarian issue mm. here. But, you know, um, you have to understand that, all jokes aside, 250 years ago, we said, oh, yeah, you white fellas can come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were almost... I don't think we quite no, said that, Bob. No, no please. <laughs> well, yeah, you're probably right. My mob, the Gokadoos... I don't think we quite the said that. The didn't okay. say it. My mob... But just but no, no, bring this family finish. back to Bill. Let me finish... You know, we allowed these people to come in and, and, and we were almost annihilated as a race of people, we Australians. Now, you know, um, I'm just saying, look at the history books and just think about this. And we're not opening the doors because our social welfare payments are double the income of most countries on Earth. Mm. If you can get in here, you will die to get in here. OK, we... I just want to get some clarity, though, on whether this family should be brought back to Biloela. Labor's position, Murray, what? Absolutely, yes. Clear. That family should be allowed to go back. So, so, Murray, you're going to change the border yeah. protection rules for Australia? You're going to yeah. set a precedent case? No, well, no, David, Keith, you were just trying to argue the opposite finish, point. Please. Keith, put that I've, question I've, again. I've actually met with a number of the advocates, and I can see some of them here. And congratulations for your tireless work over four years on behalf of this family. Um, I mean, there are any number of reasons that this family should be allowed to go back to Billow. Um, the basic humanity that Bronwyn was talking about, this is a community that wants this family back. Mm. This country is screaming out for meat workers and other skilled workers. The dad is a meat worker. He was working in the meat working plants in Billow Ooh. before he was taken I'm away. The mum, the, mum, the mum was volunteering at St Vinnie's. They were, they were doing everything that every, anyone ever asks a refugee to do in this country. And they'd integrated fully. They were loved by the community. The minister has the power at will to allow this family to go back. He could have done it at any point in the last four years and he can do it now. And that's before we get to the fact that it's cost the taxpayer $50 million <laughs> over four years in locking this, fam locking this family up, running it through the courts. It is just wrong on every level and they should be allowed back. Yeah, David, just very quickly, Bob. My union, the CFME, has been called racist because we see these people coming in. Your government was bringing in three or 400,000 a year, taking our jobs and undermining our pay and conditions. Oh. And, Keith, and Keith is dead right. No, no, I believe this Willa family should come here. No question about it. 
I believe they should come here, right? But if you're asking me whether we change the rules, you know, Keith, you get your question in here because it is a vital question. You open the doors and you'll undermine our pay and conditions. The old Labor Party, which you're not a member of, you'd be, you'd be thrown out. <laughs> the new Labor would be thrown out. I've probably out. been a member of the Labor Party. Yeah, 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 I know, know, but, I know so, but you're not okay. a member of the Labor Party. But Bob Cater, just my family, we, we do need to get to our last questions. Well, we're saying we, we should bring this you, family. You allow... You, you, you undermine our pay and conditions, and that's what the wealthy, rich, powerful corporations right. want. They want an open-door policy to undermine our pay and conditions and take our jobs off us, and you're agreeing okay. with them, my that's friend. Got a little bit away from the question. A little bit away from the question. Bronwyn, can I just quickly come back to you? Uh, when was the last time you spoke to the family? How are they doing? And the fear that you expressed about what might happen post-election, is that one they hold? Yeah, definitely. We, we speak to the family, um, you know, almost every day to check in with them and they still know they're connected to their community in Biloela. Um, they are terrified. We remember after the last election um, when LNP got back in, it was devastating um, for them to know that, you know, um, they weren't going to be able to come home straight away. And then not long after that, there was the attempted deportation um, and we had to stop, you know, with a court injunction um, mid-air. So they are petrified. We are all petrified that that's going to happen again mm. and all that right. that's Mr Morrison's plan. Bronwyn, thank you for, uh, for that. Let's get to our final question tonight, which comes from Luke Smart. State and federal government made the commitment to close the gap by 2031 for First Nations Australians. Sadly, after more than a decade, a decade of work and investment, outcomes are not improving, the gap's not closing, and mob is losing hope. In an environment of economic recovery from COVID and natural disasters, which is seeing great levels of investment, targeted investment by governments, how can government also aggressively invest in closing the gap with less than a decade to go until a deadline? Bronwyn. Wow, I could spend the rest of the night. <laughs> Thank you, Luke, for that question. Um, close the, closing the gap is a huge agenda. It is and saddens me every year when I open that Close the Gap report mm. and I look for, you know, any changes from the year before and I get deflated again. And nowadays I just think, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm just keeping working for a better life, a better world, um, a better community for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, working with community-controlled health sectors. If people are working in health and they're not working with our community-controlled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services, they're missing a mark straight away. We need to be having Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices at every level, from the senior top level, voice to parliament, Uluru's statement from the heart, voice, treaty, truth, in that order, no other order, voice, treaty, truth. Um, constitutional enshrinement of a First Nations voice from that level and seeing that trickle down right across into policy, into programs on the ground so that we can look at closing the gap, so that we can not have year after year still having the same discussions, mm. still having the same reports, still hearing the statistics that we say, why isn't anything changing? How come things aren't changing? We should be looking at changes and outcomes in education, in health, in housing. Even today, like I saw a receipt today that showed somebody had purchased a two litre carton of milk for $9.20. Okay. We just had food pricing, a food pricing mm. inquiry two years ago, 2020 that was supposed to start addressing, first and foremost, after decades of food accessibility, nutrition and health programs, and we're still seeing a two litre carton of milk in the Northern Territory for $9.20. I can it buy it down here problems. in the grocery yeah. store in Gladstone for between three and four dollars, depending on whether I go to Coles, Woolies, IGA or another independent. I, I'm getting the wind up. We're going to have to be yeah. very quick here, but I do want to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Yeah, um, very, very yeah. briefly, David. I mean, in terms of the areas I'm responsible for, I was at MacArthur River yesterday, 24% Indigenous employment. The best thing that I can do for any Australian is make sure they have the opportunity to be employed and pay their own way. And look, the resources sector just does a marvellous job. It is them that is out in remote Australia providing those services and those opportunities, and I just think it's something we should celebrate. Amanda. The majority so, of Indigenous so people are living in urban areas. If we can here. Yeah, no. I mean, if we want to talk about economic opportunities and economic sovereignty, there are trillions of dollars waiting to land around 
doing work around climate adaptation and a lot of it actually benefits getting people right. back on country and back into land management practices. Okay. Bob Catter. Please read Sarah Madison's book on the white fellas will never get it right. Um, please read Hernando de Soto's book on why the poorest countries in the world, they cannot get a freehold title to land. I mean, Keith, your government's been there for four and a half years. You won't give my mob the right to own a piece of land. Why would you not do that? Your state government, why would you refuse a person because he's black living in a black community the right to own a piece of land? I am famous forever and I deserve no credit at all because the title deeds in Queensland are called the cattle leases. I just asked them what they wanted. They wanted a freehold private ownership title, the same as the rest of the world enjoys. So I said, yeah, right, I'll take it into Parliament. I had nothing to do with it, right? Will that, will that fix but the, the problem? But the answer is problem? there. Please, David, let me finish. Mm. You've You're got totally to get worried. a blue card, <laughs> please. Because we can't have any private enterprise, because we've got no freehold titles, we have to depend upon government jobs. If we have a beer, and everyone on earth has a beer, if we have a beer, we blackfellas, we then can't, we, we get a criminal charge, we can't get a blue card. The only jobs in the community areas, my son has been great on this, is, is government jobs. You can't get a government job, you've got a blue card. So we can't get a job and we can't own land to grow economically. No. And I mean, 54 years of age is the life expectancy on a community. Thank 54. You, the rest of Australia is 82. And what have you done about it, you blokes? Nothing. Nothing at all. Four and a half years, I've been screaming and asking questions, and I get nothing at all. You just don't care, do you? You just don't care. Before I hear finally from you, Murray Watt, um, appreciate your anger on this, Bob Catter. I would like to know, given we're in an election campaign, your anger at both sides on this issue, other issues as well. If it's a hung parliament, which the Prime Minister warns would be chaotic, who would you back? Um, there is a great quote in the parliament, and uh, uh, the Liberal Party won't like me saying this, but it was from Melbourne Easy, and he said, we got every single piece of legislation through, and we were a minority government. This is a majority government, and they've already failed on 40 separate pieces of legislation. Mm. Why did we get all those things through? Through deals with the Be Greens. Because we, no, they had to do deals with me, mate. Not the Greens, <laughs> I'm the opposite of the Greens. You may not have noticed. So it works last night. Please, David, Bob. let me yep, finish. Please. please, will you shut him up? Let me finish. <laughs> um, no, no, Albo said, why do we get it all through? Because we had to convince people that it was the right thing to do. We got it through because we had to convince people. If we couldn't convince them that it was the right thing to do, then we didn't move the legislation. Mm. There is a name for that. And it's called democracy. Hmm. So Under you, you, no, you just, Under just, you, just want to be clear, you didn't, you didn't actually formally do a deal with the minority Gillard government. Would you take a similar approach and just neither, back neither side? No, I think this time, you know, I got conned. When I had the balance of power, I got four and a half million dollars, you know, to put in market gardens. You see any market gardens out there? The money was put there, hmm. but nothing ever happened. So what will you do? So I've been lied to before this time. If you want my vote, and Rod Jensen, our candidate, great rugby league player, great bloke, first Australian tour, my dad. Rod said, when he was asked this question, David, that you're asking me, Rod said, you got the question back the front. It's not who I'm going to back, it's who they're going to back. God bless you, Rod Jensen. Okay. That's my answer. It's a bit of a non-answer, Bob. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's profoundly not. Okay. And everyone, oh, like everyone out here laughed, Right, everyone at that meeting laughed because it was the perfect answer. Yeah. We're not interested in what we're going to do for you. We're interested in what you're going to do for us. All right. He's Bring on the independent. I'm going to assume. Yeah. We've, we've, got to, we've got to wrap it up, right? I'm going to assume. 10 seconds. No, I'm going to assume, based on what Bob said this evening about mortality rate, around life expectancy at 54, around land tenure, around all those issues he's named, I've named, Amanda and others, and the claps that people have given during the audience that people are going to prioritise when they go to the ballot box. They're going to prioritise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Okay. It is time, folks, to move the agenda forward. Murray Watt, I've got to get the final yeah. word to you. And I want to come back to the question, which was about closing the gap, if yep. we can, sure. and what, whether Labor would be willing to invest more mm. 
to achieve more than we have on this well, problem? Well, as um, people will remember, it was a Labor government that brought out the first Closing the Gap report and made the commitments, and it's a shame uh, that we haven't seen more progress over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. as in so many other areas under this government. What we've said uh, in going into this election is that we are fully committed uh, to a voice to Parliament, and that is a really important measure uh, to ensure that First Nations people have a direct say uh, on what happens with the laws in this country, uh, especially laws that affect them directly. But we've also made commitments for more, if you like, practical steps, uh, things like uh, much greater investment in remote Indigenous housing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have been appalled in the, the trips that I've undertaken to places like Palm Island, Arakoon, various Northern Territory communities. Through COVID, when we were supposed to be socially distancing, mm -hmm. it is not uncommon to have 30 plus people living in a house. Mm -hmm. That is a national disgrace and it's got to be fixed. No, you, okay. give free, uh, okay. you give we, us free we, old title, we'll fix it for you. All right, you. we're going to have to leave. I feel like we could go for another three hours <laughs> tonight. What do you reckon? Handle and, and the terrific uh, questions. But that is all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Bronwyn Fredericks, Keith Pitt, Amanda Carl, Bob Catter and Murray Watt. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And thanks to those of you here in Gladstone and those at home sharing your questions. Next week, Stan Grant will be with you live from Brisbane at the Brisbane Powerhouse. And you can join me on Sunday morning for Insiders. We'll also be coming to you live from Gladstone. Until then, good night.